Welcome to Chapter 3. This is our third chapter for the first week of ecology. And for this chapter, we're looking at life in the water. And we're going to be talking about the water cycle and then oceans and rivers and lakes. In Chapter 2, we talked about land and the organisms that live on the land and biomes and there we talked a little bit about water but in this chapter we're really focused on that part of the earth that is covered with water which is really the the majority of the planet as you can see here 71 percent of the earth is actually covered by water uh, so we'll be uh, briefly reviewing the hydrologic cycle so you have a good understanding of that which is I'm sure a review of something that you've learned before and then we'll talk about oceans, rivers, and lakes. What we mean by the hydrologic cycle is the movement of water that really causes water to be distributed around the planet. So as water heats up, it evaporates, and when it gets up into the air, it, as that air cools, like we talked about in Chapter 2, you can have the development of clouds, and eventually the droplets in those clouds get big enough to fall back to the earth as some sort of precipitation, either rain or snow or sleet or hail, and then once on the ground or uh, or back to the earth then that water will evaporate or it'll be consumed by organisms or it'll percolate down into the ground and become some form of groundwater or it'll be surface water and that's really what this chapter is about the water that's on the surface of the earth oceans lakes and streams we can think of the water around the earth as being in three major areas or reservoirs. There's water in the atmosphere, water in rivers, and water in oceans. And the, the renewal time for that water is kind of interesting to consider. In the atmosphere, the, the water there is renewed in just nine days. And rivers, which are constantly flowing, it's 12 to 20 days. And look at oceans there, 3,100 years for the renewal of the water in an ocean. And the lakes are kind of in between that, depending on, on their size. So let's take a look at the oceans now. We start out with a map of the oceans showing the circulation patterns of the ocean water around the world. And these circulation patterns come as a result of the prevailing winds that we talked about in the last chapter, and also the rotation of the Earth. If you start out on the western coast of North America, you can see that there's a current that comes down from the north along the California coast so that if you go swimming out in California you'll find that the water is quite cold most of the year and there we have broad kelp beds and very productive environments as that water brings down lots of nutrients and organic material. Same thing is happening on the west coast of South America where water is coming up from the Antarctic area and it's coming in towards shore and bringing lots of nutrients up with us with it so that there is a huge anchovy fishery that's occurring there. If we look at the Atlantic Ocean we can see that there's a very large gyre that's going around the Atlantic Ocean with kind of a area in the middle that looks rather quiet. Um, that's the Sargasso Sea that's formed in the middle. These, these currents have been used by sailors to travel 
to the uh, Americas from Europe and then back again. Uh, they, they ride those currents in order to speed up the trip. And turtles take advantage of those as well. They're carried up along the eastern seaboard of the United States and across towards England, and there they, they make a right turn. They're able to navigate that way, and they go down along the coast, down to Africa, and then come back over to the Caribbean islands where they originally hatched out. So we see patterns around the different oceans around the world. The Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean and it's made up of six major seas and two very large gulf areas. The Atlantic Ocean to the east of the Americas is the next largest ocean and it also includes the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Mexico as well as the Caribbean Sea. The Indian Ocean is the smallest and it's between the Africa and Australia and includes the Gulf of Arabia and the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea and the Bay of Bengal just south of India. The average depth of the oceans is very similar around 4,000 meters but the deepest section is in the Pacific, the Marianas Trench, where it's 10,000 meters deep. And as you can see here, it would engulf Mount Everest. This is located west of Indonesia and a bit south of Japan and the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. When we consider the structure of oceans, we look at it first of all from different zones. Starting near the shore, we have the littoral zone, which is that very shallow section of the shoreline. As we move out further, then out to the edge of the continental shelf, where the bottom drops down dramatically, uh, that's the neuritic zone. Uh, the combination of littoral zone and neuritic zone are where most of the organisms are located in the oceans. And then we get to the oceanic zone. The oceanic zone is that section of the ocean beyond the continental shelf. And here we divide the ocean up um, vertically. And we start out with the epipelagic region, which is the the top section of the water column, epi as in um, epidermis, and then the mesopelagic zone, uh, the middle zone, and then the bathypelagic, which is uh, the lower zone. Uh, underneath that, in the very, very deep areas, we have the abyssal zone and the hadal zone in the, in the deepest areas of all. Those organisms that live on the bottom of the ocean are called benthic organisms, and those that live in the water column are called pelagic organisms. Looking at various physical, physical conditions of the oceans, we first consider light. Light penetration into water is uh, somewhat limited. And you can see that the majority of the oceans are without light. It's just black down there except for those creatures that can bioluminesce and produce their own light. We run into this in some of our research even in the shallow waters of the coral reef that not all the different colors of light penetrate the water column and so we have to adjust our photographs in order to accommodate uh, that light penetration. The limited light penetration has a particular impact on the growth of plants and it limits that growth to the, the very shallow 
portions of the ocean like the epipelagic region and the littoral region that we talked about earlier. Temperature is a very critical condition of oceans. You've probably heard about coral bleaching in the Caribbean and other parts of the tropical warm waters. And this is a result of the, uh, in, to some extent, the increased temperature of the surface waters. The sunlight tends to increase the temperature of water and it causes the water molecules to move more quickly and that reduces the density of the water. And then that floats up to the top and then the warmer water is sinking down to the bottom. So sometimes you get a division of warm water and cold water and a very quick transition area in between the two called a thermocline. And you can find this condition in lakes as well as oceans. I talked earlier when we were looking at the, the map of the world and all the different oceans about the currents that we see circling around the Pacific and the Atlantic. These circle, circular currents are called gyres and they move to the right in the northern hemisphere and left in the southern hemisphere as we saw on the map. In addition to these surface currents which are mainly wind driven, there are deep water currents that when they bump into a continent um, rise up to the surface water and it's called upwelling. These upwellings bring lots of nutrients up into the area where the fish and their food and plankton live. And this is the, the source of many of the large fisheries in the world. Salinity is another uh, property of the oceans. This is a chemical property and it really is the dissolved minerals in the water, mainly salt. And it's rather constant throughout the ocean, but because of the situation that we talked about earlier around the equator where we have a high amount of precipitation, the salinity here is the lowest. And then as we move up into the subtropics where we talked about uh, the deserts being over the land. This is an area where there's lots of evaporation and it exceeds the amount of rainfall. And there we have the highest salinity occurring. It's kind of interesting if, if you go snorkeling in a, on a Caribbean island and you happen to be near where a river flows in to the ocean, that water coming from the river, which is fresh water, will float across the top of the salt water in the ocean. And as you're snorkeling along, you may feel the water get a little bit cooler, but uh, you'll also see that everything gets kind of blurry because when you look from fresh water into salt water, it uh, deflects the light and and makes everything kind of blurry. If you just push your head down uh, a little bit, you know, everything will suddenly clear up because you've pushed your head through that surface layer of fresh water. One of the most critical components, chemical components of ocean water is oxygen. And oxygen, of course, is critical because every organism that lives in the water needs to have oxygen in order to survive. And the concentration of oxygen or the amount of oxygen that water can hold is much less than that that we find in the air. So that in a situation where there's a lot of organic material being dumped into the ocean, like at the mouth of a big river like the Mississippi, uh, for example, when there's a flood and huge amounts of organic material are dumped out into the ocean, it creates what is called a dead zone 
in the ocean where all of the oxygen is being used up by bacteria to decompose the organic material and there's no oxygen left for the rest of the creatures and therefore it's a dead zone. Just like plants are the base of the food chain on land, phytoplankton is the base of the food chain in the oceans. And the phytoplankton are fed on by zooplankton, which are small uh, animals that are carried around by the current. And then small fish eat these, and then larger fish, and so on. All of this is occurring in the euphotic zone, which is that part of the water column that light can penetrate. And that is part of the epipelagic zone that we talked about before. In the very deep part of the ocean, where there is some volcanic activity and there are deep water vents where uh, material is bubbling up, things like sulfur uh, provide energy for a special type of bacteria that uh, then uh, it provides energy for marine worms and is the basis for a whole community in this very deep water environment. We used to think that the ocean was so big that we could just dump anything into it and it would get washed away and wouldn't cause any problems. But now with our human population pushing 7 billion, we are having an impact on the oceans. We're harvesting too many of certain species of fish and not allowing them to reproduce effectively and maintain their populations. And we're dumping enough material into the ocean that the littoral zones are becoming polluted. This is particularly impacting the coral reefs. Reefs are mainly found in the shallow marine waters, although now they are finding some reefs in deeper waters. They tend to, to be close to the shoreline. And one situation uh, that we see as far as the development of reefs is concerned is that they would form around a volcanic island. And then as that island sinks down, the reefs then grow up around it and they grow higher and higher and uh, actually become further and further from the island. Eventually, if the island subsides down below the water level, then you end up with an atoll that uh, is just a circle of reefs without any island in the middle. So we have fringing reefs and barrier reefs and then atolls as basic structures. Other shallow water uh, areas that are very productive are the kelp beds. The kelp plants can grow as tall as a hundred feet and in this environment there are many different organisms but one of the most popular is the sea otter which feed on abalone and you can see them holding on to a kelp plant laying on their back and breaking open an abalone shell uh, and then feasting on it. Both the kelp beds and the coral reefs are very fragile ecosystems that are limited by the water temperature which is held very constant. For example in the tropics the temperature may range between 82 to 79 degrees year-round and that is critical to the survival of the coral. They have plenty of sunshine in this environment but they do depend on water currents washing in constantly and bringing in oxygen and washing away some of the organic pollutants and sediment that tends to come from the shoreline in these environments. As we move further in towards shore from the shallow marine waters, we get to the intertidal zone. And the important thing here is not to memorize the, the different sections of the intertidal zone, 
but to understand really what this zone is, it's an area between the very lowest tide and the highest tide. And a tide is just the movement of water up the shoreline and then back down again on a daily or sometimes twice daily basis. When they use the term diurnal to uh, refer to a daily pattern and semi-diurnal would be uh, two periods during a day for low and high tide. So the important thing here is that uh, these organisms in the intertidal zone have to put up with some dry periods and some very wet periods at time. At times they might be totally underwater and other times totally out of the water. So they have to have mechanisms to deal with that. And this results in uh, zonation of species, meaning that certain species uh, occur in areas where there's only a little bit of water and then moderate amounts of water and then totally uh, inundated with water except for a very uh, short period of time. Uh, those of you that have gone to Jamaica, and some of you will be going to Jamaica, we spend a day on the rocky shore looking at this zonation pattern and studying the inhabitants of the tide pools there. Now we move inland even further into areas where rivers are impacted by the salt water. As tides come in, they actually move up into the mouths of rivers. So there's salt water that's moving up the river and it, it may reach quite far up into a river system uh, several miles. And often the mouths of these rivers are marshes. And we call them estuaries or um, mangrove forests. And these are very productive areas that provide a wonderful nursery area for many different species. The young can grow up here without the danger of many of the predators that they would find in the more open ocean environment. As you can see from the map, the location of estuaries and mangrove swamps is on the coastal areas where the largest human populations exist. And so this has caused some serious problems in that when these areas are developed, they're often drained and they build high-rise uh, resorts along the shoreline and eliminate these very important nursery areas. These are also areas where a lot of waste material is naturally broken down before it gets into the ocean. So as this, these areas are developed and ruined, then that natural decomposition of organic material doesn't occur, and so we have degradation of the reefs going on. Now we move into the freshwater environment, and we start with rivers and streams. As you move down a stream, you come across slow-moving areas, generally pools, and some smooth, rapid areas, which are called runs, and then the whitewater areas, which are riffles and rapids. As you consider the, the width of a stream, there's that section that's the actively moving water, and then the section where the, the bank is wet, and then as you move further to the side, you get into the riparian zone. You often hear about riparian vegetation and how important that is, and that's because that vegetation holds the bank in place and is critical when the river rises and starts rushing along very, very quickly. The vertical uh, aspect of a river. You have the water surface and the column of water and then the benthic zone down at the bottom of the river just like we had the benthic zone when we were talking about the oceans. I'm sure you're familiar with the major rivers 
around the world because they've played such an important role in history. They were initially the major highways for transportation across the continents and still play a major role in the transportation of goods. Uh, major rivers like the St. Lawrence are pathways into and in out of the North American continent. Rivers like the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Amazon, the Danube, and the Nile are critical to commerce in those, on those various continents and also are a major component of farming by bringing in the, the sediment that's so important for the continuation of fertile lands in those areas. Other terms that are used to describe rivers and streams such as hyporheic and phreatic zone and stream order, you don't have to memorize those terms but just understand that there is a transition uh, between the groundwater and surface water in streams that is um, the, the groundwater actually feeds into the surface water in some areas bubbling up as little springs and organisms move back and forth between the surface water and the groundwater on the bottom of streams. The stream order just is a method of categorizing the different sections of a stream from the headwaters to the midsections and then further down as this, the stream turns into a large river. Just as in the oceans we need to consider the physical conditions of rivers and streams, in here light is a very important component too since light generates photosynthesis in the water. You can think of streams running through the woods. There wouldn't be a lot of light penetrating here and typically the temperature of the water is lower in this environment than when it gets out into a grassy field or going through farmland. The movement of water is critical since this is how uh, sediment gets eroded into the river and ends up producing a lot of the suspended uh, bottom materials that later on get distributed throughout the flood plain or the basin of the river. And then temperature is certainly critical since the oxygen concentration is closely tied to temperature. The higher the temperature, the less oxygen uh, you'll find in the water. It is true that the water temperature does closely track the air temperature in many situations, but in a situation where there is a lot of groundwater, this may not be the case. And that's certainly the, the situation in many trout streams. When we consider the chemical conditions of rivers, uh, salinity plays an important part in terms of salt washing in from the roadways in areas where they do a lot of salting. But the big thing is oxygen. Just as it was in, in the oceans, the amount of oxygen in water is limited compared to in the air. And especially in areas where there's a lot of organic pollution coming into the river, then the bacteria is using up the oxygen to break down that organic material and there's not much left for the fish. Also, washing in from cities and farms are many chemicals and fertilizers that cause excessive plant growth in the rivers and streams and this causes some serious problems for the fish as well. Next we have the freshwater lakes and we're in a unique position here in Milwaukee in that we're next to the Great Lakes which is one of the largest reservoirs of fresh water in the world. The structure of lakes is somewhat similar to what we discussed for oceans with a little bit different terminology. We have the shallow areas, the littoral zone, 
in the limnetic zone, which is the open lake areas, and then the upper water surface is called the epilimnion, and that's followed by the metalinion below that, and the hypolimnion, which is usually cold, dark waters at the bottom of the lake. That transition zone it, in between the epilimnion and the hypolimnion is also referred to as the thermocline. Warm water fishes like pike and muskie tend to live in the epilimnion, while cold water fishes like trout often live below the metalinion and the hypolimnion if there's enough oxygen. And this is referred to as a two-story fishery where uh, fisheries managers can all actually maintain two very different types of species in the same lake environment. The difficulty is that there's a lot of organic decomposition in the hypolimnion and oxygen is often depleted. When we consider the physical conditions of lakes, we have some of the same items to, to look at as we did with oceans, a light temperature and water movement. Light penetration in lakes is really important, so those uh, brown, muddy lakes often uh, have few aquatic plants growing as in them, whereas the clearer lakes often have a, a, an abundant and diverse group of plants. The temperature in lakes is a very interesting area to study since it changes dramatically through the seasons in our part of the world. And we'll look at that seasonal change in the next slide. The movement of water is very much wind driven and depends on the orientation of the lake and the, the uh, predominating winds in the area. Seasonal changes in temperature, as I mentioned, are very interesting for in lakes. In the summertime, we have the warm water, which is less dense, rising to the surface, and then we have the thermocline in the midwater ranges, very narrow band, and then the cold water on the bottom. In the fall, the wind tends to mix the water all the way down to the bottom because the surface temperature is become similar to the the middle and lower temperatures so the water can mix. And then in the winter time we have restratification with the slightly warmer water on the bottom because water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. As the water warms up in the spring then and it reaches four degrees Celsius throughout the water column, the wind turns the water over, causes it to circulate from top to bottom, and then we have a reestablishment of the thermocline again for the summer. When we consider the chemical conditions of lakes, one of the important things again is oxygen. Oxygen is critical to all organisms surviving, as we talked about before, and oxygen and nutrients kind of go together in lakes. One of the nutrients that gets into lakes from the land is phosphorus. So in an oligotrophic lake, we have low phosphorus levels and low production, but we have very high oxygen concentration. And so there may not be a lot of uh, fish and other organisms in that environment. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a eutrophic lake, which has high levels of phosphorus washing in from the surrounding watershed and high biological production as a result of that nutrient, and very often very low oxygen concentrations. A lake can be in serious trouble if it's highly eutrophic. Two major problems that have come up as a result of humans living around lakes and using lakes is the, the runoff of agricultural and municipal wastes into the lake, and then the introduction of exotic species like the zebra mussel as 
people uh, have built cottages and houses around the lake, they really haven't considered the impact that they're having on the lake and they could actually ruin the beautiful environment and the ecosystem that caused them to purchase the house in the first place. Exotic species are introduced into lakes when boaters move from one lake to another and they don't clean off the bottom of the boat or the propeller and they transfer particularly aquatic plants from one lake to another and attached to the aquatic plants will be things like zebra mussels and even the aquatic plants themselves may be invasive species that they're transferring from one lake to another causing all sorts of problems. This summer WLC students did an extensive survey on Pewaukee Lake in order to measure the distribution of an invasive species, the Eurasian milfoil. This plant at one time practically covered Pewaukee Lake, but now with careful management and removal of many of the plants using weed cutters, the Eurasian milfoil population has gone down and has been replaced by a lot of native species in the lake uh, fish population has responded very well to this careful management. So for this chapter then you should have a basic understanding of the hydrologic cycle and a understanding of the structure and chemical nature of oceans as well as a little bit of an understanding of the current uh, major circulation patterns in the oceans. In the shallow marine waters you should know what some of the basic uh, components of that are, that the uh, coral reefs for example. In the marine shores we talked about the intertidal zone and we also mentioned estuaries and salt marshes and mangrove forests. You should understand the importance of those systems to the near shore marine waters. For rivers and streams we learned about the basic structure and chemical nature of those systems and also for lakes we, we learned about their structure and chemical composition. You should know the general concepts associated with each of these. Mm -hmm.